What is real? How do you define real? You can't jump into cash. Cash is trash. What do you do? You get out. Alex Vetsky is a longtime entrepreneur and writer. Alex has founded numerous companies across a multitude of industries. His most recent being the Bitcoin finance app Amber and the Bitcoin Times publication. He's most well known for his early philosophically oriented essays on Bitcoin and especially his more controversial takes on democracy, the state and the idea of the remnant. He now spends most of his time writing, speaking, podcasting, and thinking about ways in which the nature of the world will evolve as the grand cycle we're currently in comes to a close and a new one emerges. Alex was on episode 12, The End of Globalism, where we covered a lot of his earlier writings and think pieces. He was also on episode 69 with Jessica Vaughn on Bitcoin truth, freedom chutzpah, and letting the dead leaves fall. Mark Moss is no stranger to making money. By the time he was 30, he had amassed 25 million in real estate holdings. When the housing market crashed in 2008, he lost everything, but he dusted off and rebuilt his businesses and investments. And this time he knew that simply accumulating wealth wasn't enough. He needed to learn how to protect his wealth and gain his own financial and personal sovereignty. Now it is, it is his mission. Now it is his mission is to share that wisdom with as many people as possible. Through his YouTube videos with 20 million plus views, a nationally syndicated iHeart radio show and through his online programs. Mark is helping people understand that the most important issues facing the world today and what they can do to build, grow, and protect their wealth. Mark was also on episode 81, the last time these three cycles uh, were going through, the last time these three cycles collided and the whole world changed. Alex and Mark, welcome back to the Bitcoin Matrix podcast. How are you guys? Uh, Doing great. Thank you. Doing great, Cedric. Thanks for having us back. Yeah, guys, uh, it's, it really is exciting to have you guys back. It was a lot to get through your intros. You guys are up to a lot these days. Um, I'd love to get uh, really into the book, though. So um, how did you two come to partner up on even just writing any book, much less this one? Salvador, I'll, uh, I'll, let, I'll let Mark, Mark tell the story. Yeah, well, it actually happened uh, at the time of when you recorded that episode with uh, Jessica and, and Alex. Uh, we were we were all down in El Salvador at the time, and uh, on on all kind of on a trip together. And I had brought a copy of the original Communist Manifesto, and um, I was uh, like, "Have you guys read this thing? Because uh, it's pretty crazy, and I can't imagine a lot of people would like it if they actually took the time to read it." And at that time, if you remember, like BLM was raging, right? And like the leaders of BLM were like, "Oh, we're trained Marxists," you know. So it was like kind of getting this like resurgence, you know. And it was like, man, can you believe what's in this book? I don't think these people have even read this book. And then it was kind of like, if more people read the book, if they knew what was in it, they maybe wouldn't like it as much as, it, as you know, they think they do. And uh, I think that's how the idea got the spark. And then uh, we sat on it for a while. And finally, about, um, I don't know, six months later, Svetsky was like, uh, dude, let's do this thing. Let's just make it happen. And, and we busted out pretty quick. And I do apologize. So just to preface, I mean, the book you guys wrote that's coming out is the On Communist Manifesto. So just historically, though, what was the context of the times that the Communist Manifesto was written in? Uh, well, it was written in 1850, right? And 1850 was kind of right in the guts of the Industrial Revolution, right? The, the French Revolution had happened, I don't know, half a century prior to that. And you, you had all these kind of you had the tail end of the enlightenment thinkers supposedly kind of blending ideas and you know a lot of it emerged with this idea of you know democracy and equality and uh you know extensions of natural rights and this and that and you know you you had you had visible hardships because you know as with anyone if you're an individual and you have uh, limited wealth, you know, you have to, as I see, uh, as I say, um, eat shit now and eat caviar tomorrow, right? You need to work your way up. Uh, if you're a startup, like startups don't, you know, start and have like all of the money in the world, you know, like they basically work for free. They clean the toilet, they do this, they, they, you know, the founder does everything until 
you know, he hits the ball out of the park. Same as nation states, a nation as it's emerging and moving from, you know, what, what preceded it, which was a far more uh, feudal system, uh, peasant hierarchies and all that sort of stuff, which had existed for the prior thousand years, um, needed to kind of emerge from that. And, and you had these brainlets like Marx and Engels in particular, who decided that the way to solve the suffering was to equalize everyone um, and have some central state entity decide who gets what uh, and ration out the resources. Um, and you know they basically made the protagonist the proletariat, which is the worker. And they said that that is the productive person uh, of society. And it's interesting because it came really quickly off the, off the heels of, um, of the kind of, like, as capitalism really emerged, it, it flipped the, the prior system of, like, you know, nobility and royal hier hierarchy and the, and the church and the, you know, the combination of the church and state. So there was a massive... Uh, shift and rebalancing of power through markets effectively opening up. And yes, of course, there was colonialism, there was slavery, there was all sorts of stuff, but it was, you know, it was a, a, a grand process of discovery. Um, and, you know, there, there were quite a few thinkers, like there's another book that was written at the same time as, at the, same time as uh, the Communist Manifesto, which is called The Law by Frederick Bastiat, mm -hmm. same year, 1850. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, lo and behold, very few people have read that one, but many, many, many people have read the Communist Manifesto and given themselves brain cancer. And, you know, we, we've sort of had this, you know, I guess Marx was, and if you know a little bit about him, and Marx talks about this quite a bit, is like, he was a bitter man who was angry at the world, angry at himself, angry at his family, you know, and he, he basically projected all of these you can you can just kind of read the salt in his in his texts and he projected all of this crap onto humanity and basically made a call to arms to the working class to tear civilization down and to take you know apparently what's theirs which was not theirs uh and in the process you know uh destroyed you know, the fabric of not just one civilization, but many around the world. Every time it's been tried, uh, it's been a disaster. Mm. Like, I'll, I'll say one last thing quickly is I've, I've just been, I just finished an audio book. I've been on a major history rampage. And the latest one that I just hit was uh, the history of China from the over 5,000 years from Yao to Mao. And the guy who was like, uh, the professor who did it, like, man, at the end, I just wanted to, throw my phone against mm. the wall because he was such a communist apologist like he mm. made all these like he talked about the you know the imperial background of china and all of the sort of stuff that emerged and then at the end like you know he, he makes a point to talk about you know the the brutality and massacres and everything that happened prior but then he just kind of glosses over the um the part about the communists or at least he glosses over the the atrocious part so you know he, he drives the word you know, when the communists came in, you know, Mao did what uh, he had to do through land reforms. What were the land reforms? <laughs> they went in, they confiscated everyone's land at gunpoint, and they then divvied it out. And then later, the you know, the so-called great leap forward, um, these idiots, typical communists, there was a complete uh, discrepancy between the numbers that they have and the actual real uh figures of production because they communized everything um, that everyone died of starvation. <laughs> it was Man. insane. Um, and, you know, you've got these people that are just sort of whitewashing all that stuff and, and glossing over it. So anyway, I've kind of gone off on a bunch of tangents there, but well, I don't know I, what the original I think was. I think it was a, I think it was a great question to ask. And I'd like to add just a couple of pieces to that as well. I think uh, understanding, you know, who he was and what he meant and what he, you know, what his worldview was, was, was important. And, and Alex did a good job hitting that. I think it's also to understand what the, the way the world was at that time as well. Right. So it was like, just as 
the whole world had been basically agrarian farmers, right, throughout history, and it was the the advent of the industrial revolution. And so we had just seen uh, machines that could now do the work of five thousand men, and it started moving people from the farms where they had been with, working with their families and their villages into cities and into factories. I would imagine. Uh, it was probably horrible working conditions. <laughs> the machines were probably horribly unsafe at the time. Um, you know, at the time you had families working together on farms. I would imagine you had families working together in factories. And so it probably was not an easy transition, like all transitions, right? Transitions are messy. And so he was also writing it from that time point with that, with that view and that perspective. And so a couple of things he talks about, like, for example, is that um, the, the poor people, um, he, they, have, they have no capital all they have is their labor, right? Mm -hmm. They have no capital. And uh, he was very mad at the world because he wanted to survive writing literature and poetry and nobody valued it at the time. But today you can do that. And so we make the case in, in our book, The Uncommunist Manifesto, that um, everybody has capital and maybe it's not money capital, but it's intellectual capital, right? And so uh, at that time of place where he was writing it, maybe his view was a little bit right. Maybe it was a little bit misguided, but at that time, we, it was just a different world. And so I think it's important to understand that as well. And then, of course, we have the benefit of hindsight. So now we've seen these Marxist ideas been uh, tried many times, as Alex, again, was pointing out. Um, you know, we've seen it uh, tried in Russia, 25 million people starving to death. We've seen it happen in, in uh, China with 50 million people starving to death. And we're now about to witness it with a billion people starving to death. Hmm. Um, and so we have the benefit of hindsight, which is uh, interesting as well. Yeah, I think you guys both brought up fantastic points. I think what I heard there early on was around uh, democracy and colonialism, which I think we'll touch on in a bit, but also around sources and structure and, and the struggle and the struggle of the individual. And uh, what I like about this book, though, uh, before we get into one of the next ideas, is, is the way you structured the book uh, uh, with really uh, the beginning up front with definitions. So we won't get into a lot of those definitions here now, uh, but it was well worth my time to read through the definitions. I, I think that level setting is great. And I thought the way you guys uh, approach the definitions and what you got across there was very effective. So what is this idea of static versus dynamic classes? And can we tell, can we judge the individual by the group the individual is in? Uh, you, okay, so, sorry, I thought Mark was gonna take that. Um, So, so can you can you rephrase the question? What what what, what do you? What is you know? I'm trying to get at the this idea of static versus dynamic classes. Maybe what <laughs> Marx was getting at uh, are these classes real, and can we tell a lot from you know about the individual from the group that we we label them in? Okay, you, so you want me to take it, or are you going to take? <laughs> yeah, so ahead. so let, I'll I'll give it a shot. So classes, I think, will always exist, right? Because People are different, and you know the, the there's two there's two threads to pull on here. You know, is is one that um, you know, if I'm a surf guy and um, I you know enjoy surfing, and you know I don't bother working much or whatever. You know, I just like have a part time job. Let's say I'm a tradie, and I like you know carpentry and surfing that's it i'm going to be in a particular economic class um i will not probably be hanging out with uh bill gates hopefully not ever but you know or, or you know software silicon valley people right for example um they are fundamentally two classes of people now those groups and those effective classes that these people are a part of Yes, they do actually define some element of the person, but the thing is each person can be part of multiple groups. So the challenge with trying to pigeonhole people into or completely define them by a single group is that you negate all the multidimensionality of human beings. So for example, Mark and I, we are both Bitcoiners, um, but in our own private lives, we do, you know, other things very, very differently. You know, I'm nomadic, I travel, um, I, you know, write and abuse people online, basically. Mark has a family. Uh, he also travels. He's a great surfer. Um, I couldn't surf if my life depended on it. And, you know, 
last time I tried in Salvador where we decided to write the book, I almost drowned. So it's like, you know, in, in all of these sort of different dimensions, we're different. So, so we make up multiple groups, but each one of those groups, you know, kind of uh, make up a component of our, of our broader identity. And, you know, the difference between static and dynamic classes is the fact that when you try and equalize everyone, uh, you create these static classes. So, you, and what, what you do is you cut the legs off of uh, meritocracy, you can't, you know, rise and fall. Whereas dynamic inequality recognizes the fact that we are all different. We are all multidimensional. We are always going to be part of a different group, different class, et cetera. And what should happen is that people should rise and fall based on the decisions they make, based on the groups they have, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So I want to touch maybe more on social mobility and the rising and the falling. Uh, maybe how did Marx see social mobility and, and the ossification of classes? And, and the other thing I want to note is, is, Alex, you mentioned before about how you know, the Communist Manifesto was a call to arms, maybe to the proletariat. And, and I, I, I think, and, and you guys have said this in your writing, I think, is, is the book is a call to arms to the individual. So maybe uh, how do you guys see individual mobility? Well, I think I think he kind of made a made it made a good point. I mean, uh, he obviously defined it. Marx defined it as, um, you know, just two classes, right? So the rich and the poor, proletariat and bourgeoisie. And what defines that? Is there a certain level of income that automatically makes me a rich person? Uh, and if so, am I then automatically a uh, an oppressor at the same time? Right. And I think it's I think it's I think it's pretty crazy to see that, although if you look back through history, you know, there's plenty of examples of caste systems where there's two two classes or maybe a couple of classes, but they're not allowed to move between those classes. Right. If you're born in one class, you're stuck in that class. You're not allowed to associate with the people in different classes and you're stuck there. Uh, whereas uh, to the point I think Alex was making is that we believe that uh, that's not the way the world works and we should be able to move between classes if you will so like maybe i want to be a surf bum i want to work five hours a week and i'm happy to live on the beach and surf and fish but then i might grow up and in a decade i might decide i don't want that anymore and i might want to move to the city start a business make some money and then you know hobnob in in high, high society and i should be, be able to do that um and so you know uh we obviously support a system that would allow people to do that you know a free market system a capitalist system but at the same time i think we're also making the case that we want, um, in order for that system to really work, um, not only do we need a true meritocracy where people can move up by their merits based off of if they want to do that or not, but also that um, people that are at the top should also be able to fall from that position. And I think that's a big piece that we really want to hit on because you know the, the fiat money system that we have today allows these uh, people at the top to have these entrenched positions and there's no accountability and they make bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. They get bailed out by the taxpayers. For example, uh, they use the government to build moats for themselves, and it prevents them from falling even when they have made you know horrible and uh, and uh, horrible horrible decisions. So I think it's I think it's both of those having the ability to move up and down. And I think that's the part that we'd like to hit on because while everybody wants equality or they think they do, right? The media is trying to tell people they want equality. Um, they want why why is Jeff Bezos so rich? Why, why does he get all that while I don't? Um, but do they want to work 100 hours a week for 20 years in a row? Most people probably don't want that. And so, well, if he does, shouldn't he be able to have different things? So I think th th those are part of the ideas. Like I said, the big piece about this fiat money system, really allowing those people at the top to stay there. And we need a system that allows people to rise up, but also one that allows people to fall down. Right. In terms of up and down, uh, for Alex, why are hierarchies important to society? It's funny. Uh, so now the next book I'm devouring is about the French Revolution because I want to understand uh, where a lot of these crazy ideas came from um, and what the sort of social, political, economic and kind of zeitgeist of the time were. And, you know, the I mean... Most of the crap that you read about those periods these days, though, is like real, you know, leftist, uh, you know, revisionist crap history. Um, so, so you got to kind of like uh, navigate your way through it with, um, you know, with a whole chunk of salt. But what's interesting is uh, they they frame hierarchies as being bad. It's like uh, 
the the part that I'm listening to now. It's like, oh, you know, the the the, the France of the uh, royal period in the 1600s, 1700s was all about hierarchy, and people didn't know where the hierarchy came from. It was just all hierarchy. And the thing is, like, that hierarchy didn't just like, you know one day just appear like that. It emerged over time. Uh, hierarchies naturally always emerge and they are fundamentally the only way that we're able to prioritize things. Like as, as human beings, we're always contending with the fact that you have a limited amount of time. Even if you could somehow have unlimited energy and unlimited um, uh, resources, you would still have limited time. You can't escape that. As a result, you will always need money. That, that's where like these idiots who talk about like, um, uh, what, what's it called? The, the invention of the Star Trek, uh, you know, the thing that creates anything you want, whatever mm. it's called, I don't know, the, the, the gadget. But basically they say, once we invent that, then we won't need money anymore. It's like, uh, I think you forgot about time moron because we're always gonna, we're always gonna need to somehow prioritize stuff. So what that means is, in our DNA, in our very makeup as human beings, as living creatures, we must prioritize things. And to do that, we need to form hierarchies. And those hierarchies need to be malleable. They need to evolve. They need to adjust. But there is always going to be something important and then things that come underneath. Um, and when we want to build infrastructure, like in the physical world, you know, a building is a hierarchy, <laughs> you know? It's and you build a foundation, then you you build the things, and you you build on top of it. And you know you can't just sit there and say, okay, well, just because uh, you know there's an 18th floor and a first floor, you know it's unfair. So now let's bomb the building and equalize it all. That's not how it works. Um, but you know, in these people's minds that want to abolish hierarchy, they they just they don't understand, uh, I guess, natural law or physics or you know any of these sort of basic fundamentals. So hierarchy will always exist. It's important for prioritization. What matters though, is that we have hier like emergent hierarchies of competence versus hierarchies of fiat. And, and those two are very different. It's like an emergent hierarchy is something that actually, uh, th there's, there's a process of revolution in there in the sense of when something gets stale, when the hierarchy gets a little bit too big, when it starts to stultify, when it becomes more of a hierarchy of decree, it should fall apart. And then new competence should sort of rise up and the hierarchy re-evolves and readjusts. That's sort of an emergent hierarchy, whereas a hierarchy by decree is completely artificial. And that's kind of what we have today is we have these complete uh, ass backwards mm. civilizations where we're tearing up and eating through the capital that we've built over the last three or four centuries, uh, all because we have incompetence uh, in position of power because it's given itself uh, authority via decree. So the, the hierarchy is all messed up. Um, and you know, that's a problem, but we, we, need to, we need to make that distinction because if we don't make that distinction, then it's all wrong. Right. It, it seems like, and you guys laid this, out, laid this out well in the book, in terms of hierarchy, it seems like in terms of feudal, it's sort of hereditary and it's fixed. And we've moved from you know, more towards modern cronyism on our way to communism which are also both fixed, uh, both politically and economically. Uh, Mark, uh, I'm really, uh, and I like how you talked about how, you know, it's good for the, the individual or, you know, to be emergent within the hierarchy there, Alex. So Mark, I'm kind of curious, what is entropy and what is the individual's relationship to entropy? Well, entropy is, uh, is, a, is the natural state of things, which means that uh, order tends to fall apart a trend and entropy would just fall apart so if i built a house and i left it alone for 50 years that house starts to fall apart hmm. if i perfectly manicure my garden uh and i leave it alone it falls apart right and so uh humans humans strive to have order in their life and we need uh energy to get more order um otherwise things left on their own tend towards entropy and so um, it takes time, it takes effort, it takes energy, it takes intentionality to build things with order. Um, but then over time, then they, like I said, trend towards entropy start start falling apart. Was that the question? What was entropy? Uh, yeah. And then what is the individual's relationship to entropy? 
Well, I think the individual relationship is the same, right? So I think you can see that uh, an individual who puts that time and attention and, and intentionality into their um, themselves, they can get smarter, right? They get in better shape. They build habits that that propel their life forward. They have discipline. Um, and uh, once you stop, uh, once you stop going to the gym, once you stop having a morning routine, once you stop eating well, you see what entropy does uh, does to your body. And so, um, you know, that's part of, you know, part of, I, I guess, uh, like I said, it's this natural state that we all have to resist. And so, you know, through a fiat money system, it starts to change uh, one, it starts to change like our long term perspectives. And so then we start making decisions that really feed into that entropy. Um, as opposed to um, allowing us this long term, like I know I'm working out today for my future self, for example, right? I know I'm saving money today for my future self. Um, and so that fiat money uh, system really changes that the short term thinking, but also even to the point where I can't even think long term because I can't save my money. And if I can't save my money, then how do I plan for the future? Um, and so I think I think they're interconnected there. Right. Does progress have an upper bound? I don't believe so. Uh, my good friend, Robert Kiyosaki was working on a book that he decided to pause temporarily. And he just wrote a new book uh, about the same title as ours. Uh, but he was working on a book called Infinite Returns. And I was talking to him about it. And uh, the, the infinite returns he was talking about is um, human ingenuity. As long as we have creativity, there's no maximum to the point of what we can innovate and, and grow and have progress towards. And that's, that's the infinite return he was talking about. So I believe that to be true, which is why I think uh, one, another, one of the many reasons why this book is so important is that we're really trying to stress uh, the access of struggle isn't between two arbitrary classes. Uh, Marx defined them as rich and poor. Today we have uh, neo-Marxism or cultural Marxism, which is the struggle against everybody, uh, men and women, gays and straights, black and white, et cetera. Um, but uh, we believe that the struggle is actually between the individual and the collectivist. And the reason why that's important, I believe, is the, the individual being so important is to the question that you've asked, is, does progress have an upper bound? And so I think as long as we're all individuals that think differently, as opposed to all being group thinkers and automatons, a word that Svetsky likes to use, but as long as we're all individuals and we're, and we're individual thinkers, then we all look at the world differently. Uh, we see different problems. And more importantly, we come up with different solutions. Uh, all three of us could look at the exact same thing, but actually see something different, right? Draw different conclusions from that, come up with three different solutions for that same problem, which allows us to have that innovation, allows us to have that progress. And so, no, to, to answer your question, I don't think we have upper bounds. I believe in that infinite return. Yeah, I, I think that's really uh, important to note. And so, Alex, I'm curious, does unfettered capitalism lead to long-term centralization? Yeah, I think this is one of the fallacies because we, we make a point in there. We say that innovation basically trumps uh, everything. Um, when, when one innovates, they basically, what they're doing is they're finding a new angle for advantage, right? And to do that, um, you know, you, you need to fundamentally do something new and when, you know, th there's always this thing like, you know, IBM was going to own all the computing in the world, right? And then uh, Windows came and wiped it out, right? Then, um, you know, Windows was going to own everything. Apple came and wiped it out. Um, you know, BlackBerry was going to be all the phones, you know, that got nailed. Nokia, the same thing. Like Kodak, the same thing. Um, all of the big giants today will also get slammed as well because they, they, they've built their entire empires around a paradigm. And fundamentally speaking, when you have a paradigm shift, your monopoly ceases uh, to matter. Like there's a new dimension. And th this is sort of where whenever like governments have tried to stop monopolies, you know, all, all they've done is they've actually made it harder for competition to come in and compete and actually naturally break down those monopolies by competing with them in, uh, in certain ways. Like the, the classic uh, story of Standard Oil is actually an interesting one where uh, Standard Oil was a local monopoly in Pennsylvania, um, but it became a much larger monopoly when the government started getting uh, into the racket and they started paying people off. 
and they managed to put themselves get favorable uh basically regulation and uh uh they, they basically got a, a more favorable uh environment than the texas oil producers that were starting to emerge um, and the texas oil producers would have wiped them out because they had new oil fields etc so it's um un unfettered capitalism always equalizes or rebalances the system because whenever something grows too large and becomes monopolistic not only does it have to then contend with uh paradigm shifts that could be happening all over the place um number one but it also cannot compete with hundreds of or thousands or millions of competitors at the edge because you can't go in that many directions. Like a large scale company, for example, has to have a strategic direction. It needs to move in a particular direction and it can't just go and change its mind every five minutes uh, and mm. you know transform its direction. Like it just doesn't work. So the larger you get, the slower you become. And by definition, you miss out on other opportunities. So no, I, I guess the answer to that is like unfettered capitalism doesn't create these sort of um, uh, big behemoth monopolies it does to an extent create centralization but as centralization comes in it actually is the mechanism that makes those entities less able to adapt to the marketplace and to feedback into paradigm shifts and to competitors which then allows for new uh, entrants to come grow get large and then they go through that same cycle it's the same you know life cycle of human beings of civilizations of companies of everything it's all the same we just get in the way of it and when we get in the way of it we create these zombie entities instead that remain monopolies by virtue of the mm -hmm. fact that they get permission and uh the regulatory right to do so yeah I, I like how you guys bust the myth that uh monopolies come from capitalism in fact uh i think you guys make the the point that capitalism destroys monopolies and uh, so, Mark, I'm I'm wondering, is obsolescence via automation a bad thing for, you know, the working class or the masses? Well, I, you know, this is something that uh, we could debate forever. And it's something that I've pushed back on with the Andrew Yangs and even Jeff Booth, um, uh, who I love and respect Jeff Booth. And uh, he's a he's a giant for for sure. But uh, he also believes that this uh, automation is a bad thing. And um I think history continues to show us over and over that it's not. Um, and again, back to the, you asked me the question about, do we have an upper bound? And I said, no. So what I, what I've seen throughout history, what it shows us is that uh, it frees it. The problem I think is when you match it with a fiat money system. And so what do I mean by that? So I think we, uh, the industrial revolution that I referenced earlier, right? It, it, it was, it was the first time through all of history. We had manpower, horsepower. Now a machine could do the work of 5,000 people. Wow. What, well, that means 5,000 people are going to lose their job, right? What are they going to do with their time? This is going to be a disaster. Well, it turns out they went and studied medicine and science and all kinds of things that they had no time to study before, right? And so the world improved from that, right? And so every time we've had a new invention, uh, we've seen that. I, I found an old article when electricity first came out, and it was from the candle makers. And the candle makers were so mad because we we're going to put them all out of business. Um, you know, we've seen uh, stories of when automobiles came and the buggy makers were mad because it put them out of business, right? Uh, computers were going to put everybody out of business, right? It was going to do all these jobs. But now we have all these jobs that weren't available before around, around the computer systems. Now, um, I think the, it's, it's incompatible with the fiat money system because what happened is that uh, those machines are supposed to do the work of 5,000 people. A computer is supposed to do work that we were doing before. Um, but the problem is, and all of those things should be making our lives easier. So we should be working less and less and less to have the same quality of life that we had before. But because we're on a fiat money system and we have this massive amount of inflation, we have to continue to work harder and harder and harder. So an example of that would be coffee, right? So in 1970, a cup of coffee was 10 cents. Today, a cup of, cup, cup of coffee, I was at an event in Vegas this last weekend, it was five mm -hmm. bucks. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, wouldn't you think with all the technology and all the automation and all the supply chains, it would be easier and cheaper to get that bean of that bean of coffee from whatever Colombia or Costa Rica to, to the US in my cup today. And the answer is, of course, right? It should have gone from 10 cents to two cents, but instead it went to 10 cents to $2 or $5. And so uh, the, all these machines that we're getting, they're not making our lives easier like, they, like, they, like they're supposed to be. We're having to work harder, harder, harder. 
Um, and I think back to kind of the question you asked Alex earlier, I think in a true capitalist system, um, it would continue that way um, where we would see, yeah, certain jobs would be killed off and certain people would then have to learn new skills and they would have to reinvent themselves. Um, but we would continually find new things to do. The problem is when, when the capitalism you know, matches up with the government, we have cronyism um, and then they start to build moats around themselves. Uh, it just, the whole thing just gets messed up and, and um, it distorts itself in ways that we just don't fully understand, but we see. Uh, but back to the original question, I believe history shows it to be very clear. Um, if we were in a, in a true fixed money system, the technology wouldn't be replacing our jobs in a, in a bad way. It'd be freeing us up to work on higher value. Jobs. I, I completely agree. And uh, I want to read a little bit from, from you guys' work. So start off with a quote from Churchill. If you're going through hell, keep going. And you guys go on to write, it's a necessary rite of passage for all humans to eat shit before they eat caviar, unless you're lucky and entitled. In which case, in a free market, you'll eat caviar now and maybe one day eat shit. It reminds me of the quote by Edward Dante before he became the Count of Monte Cristo. When asked by his teacher, the priest, to define economics, his shorthand response was, dig now, money later. That's the law of sowing before reaping, or simply the reality of producing before consuming. And uh, I want to turn to um, the competent individual, which is the next piece in your work, the next chapter. But I kind of want to ask it from, why do, in, why, why do incompetent individuals want to do away with both emergent objective reality and individual subjective value. We were trying to think of a, a way to, I mean, at least I was trying to think of a way to more politely differentiate between, uh, you know, productive people and lemmings basically. Um, and I couldn't think of a, you know, a, another word other than the incompetence. And basically, you know, the, these kind of people are the ones who are the, you know, the, three face diaper wearing people walking out in the middle of the street, right? Like you see them every day. And, and, and these people, they literally, they exist in complete, uh, in a complete vacuum of objective reality. Because like, there's no objective reality that says walking around with three face diapers is gonna be good for your health. Um, it doesn't work like that, but you know, they still do it. And, you know, the, the, the same goes for the, you know, the vouchers of the world and all these sort of statists and bureaucrats who, you know, say one thing and do another. Like, you know, there's that photo that I've seen circulating recently of Bill Gates, you know, talking about health while drinking a boba, right? Like a sugar drink. It's like, you know, the, the, these, these people want to ignore all of that and basically impose subjective reality on everybody. Um, so, so it's kind of like this inversion of the two, right? So, you know, what we are espousing here is that, hey, there is objective reality that we need to recognize and we have uh, subjective values. They wanna say that value is objective, you know, that, that everyone's value is the same, uh, that we need to equalize everybody um, and that we are all in this together, we're all the same, we all need to have the same stuff. Um, and by the way, reality is completely subjective, morality is completely subjective and you know nothing matters and everything matters and all this sort of stuff. So you have this kind of like inversion and perversion of uh, reality and value. Um, and it's it's insane. Like, you know, a, another great example of like trying to objectify value is this thing about like, you know, Biden tells the, the gas stations to drop the price. Wait a minute. Well, like who, you know, or, or price controls just in general. Like, what the hell is a price control? That 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 is a complete attempt to try and objectify value. It doesn't work that way. Um, and you know, they they just can't seem to grasp this stuff. So that's why you know, a, a nice way to put it is we call them the incompetent of individuals because they're these, you know, for lack of a better term, creatures who seem to miss what's right in front of them what's real and they kind of invert the thinking and they do the complete opposite and they want that because they i don't know i guess they're too incompetent to live to function you know without somehow distorting the system you know where front is back and back is front and down is up and you know left is right like you know they, they want to invert it so that you know incompetence rules instead of competence yeah, I like how you guys phrased it in, in the book as blanket uh, objectivity. 
So Mark, uh, where does private property begin? Uh, what was that? What did you say about private property? Where yeah, where, where does it begin? So uh, <laughs> where does it begin? Go ahead. Uh, more in terms of uh, the individual, it may be, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be your house, but, you know, it, uh, you know. Well, I, I mean, I think if you want to, if you want to start it, if, if you really, you know, we talk about um, learning things at a first principles level. So then you can like build your ideas of it. So if you want to really take it down to that level, like where does private property begin? I mean, it begins with your own body. So if you think about it, right, like um, if I had a rare form of uh, diabetes or something where I couldn't, I couldn't keep any fat on my body, then I'd have to eat 24 seven. So I'd have enough energy coming into my body so I could stay alive. But then a little bit of fat on my body allow is like a battery. It's like my life's battery. And that fat allows me to stay alive um, without having to eat 24 seven. Now I could skip a couple of days and I can keep eating. So um, by me, you know, by me consuming those extra calories, which is energy, I can store it. And then um, if I need to, let's say, dig a hole for four hours a day to earn enough food um, to live, what if I work an extra eight, uh, an extra four hours? Well, now I need to be able to store that energy, right, which could be money potentially, but that's an extension of my private property. It's more of my battery. Now it allows me to buy more food the next day. Maybe eventually then I buy a cow, which now could allow is a battery that could last me. I could live now for a year, right? And right. so if you think about all of these pieces of private property are extensions of my life. They're like my battery. They allow me to stay alive for a longer period of time. Um, and so that's where it starts with your body. Nobody could move your arm but you, period. Right. That's it. Um, and so, you know, we have all these types of property, which is why they're important. And, and each piece again is, is that battery. And it was, it was earned by me expending my own energy, uh, which is why we need to protect that private property. Um, and we're, you know, gives us the incentives. Did you want to ask something about that? Well, I, I like how you guys talk about how, uh, you know, private property begins with mind, body, spirit. And it's really important to note. So continue Mark. I'm kind of curious and because according to Marx and the communist manifest manifesto, they, they wanted to abolish all private property. What, what does that even mean? <laughs> yeah, um, I think it was number five, point number five in their 10 commandments is to it. Oh, no, I'm sorry. No, he said in, in one of the chapters, he said, uh, if we summed up communism in one statement, it would be the abolition of private property. Um, maybe it's in the 10 commandments, too. I can't remember now. Uh, but he, he said, if we summed up one statement, that's what it would mean. Um, and so they just don't if you want to dig in a little bit deeper, and I don't think it was really uncovered in this book specifically, but um, you know, they believe that it's this uh, this uh, desire, this innate desire for people to have more and to gain more um, that makes us unhappy. And if they could just take away all of our private property, and this uh, statement they made in the book, which is to um, each according. Um, to their abilities, each according to their needs, meaning just do what you can and you'll have everything that you need back. Um, and if we if we can just take away all this private property, we'd get rid of all this drive, all this striving for more, we'd get rid of all this unhappiness, and then uh, we could make it where humans could achieve this higher level. Uh, I think that's really what they meant. And um, anyway, I, I guess that's my take. And so they think that we should just have no private property. It should be communal, obviously communism, communal, right? So uh, we just work and we have enough. Um, everybody shares, everybody gets along, everybody's happy because we're all the same. And um, <laughs> you'll own nothing and be happy. Yeah. Uh, to, I'm going to read from, from your work some more. So to this, we say, who are these people? Who gets to define them? Who decides who is part of what group or what class? Where is the line of private property as defined by Marx as opposed to that which is defined by the original property owner? Am I, because I was born to a shopkeeper now, someone who should have my individuality, independence, and freedom abolished? And if so, what does that then make me? Your slave? We now know full well the ramifications of this type of ideology. Hundreds of min millions of innocent people killed at the hands of their own so-called representatives. In abolishing private property, communists not only give this group of representative common forces the permission to acquire via confiscation the property of another, but give that same group the power to determine who sits in what group. This is an extremely dangerous framework, which as we've seen resulted in democide after democide. And do not dare use the age old excuse of this wasn't what Marx wanted or this wasn't real communism. 
The problem is not the ruler, but the flawed doctrines upon which the arbitrary rules are built. The abolition of the individual's right to own and acquire private property as a function of their own labor, ingenuity, skill, or talent not only destroys the private property itself, but the very foundation of individual freedom and the desire, inspiration, and motivation to pursue better ends. The greatest tragedy, the greatest tragedy of communism is not only the death of millions, but the death of their souls whilst living. There is no magical end state in which privation is removed and all humans are equally happy. This is the belief of a fool. The human spirit reaches and the human mind solves problems. So Alex, this is where you guys turn to, I think one of my favorite parts of the book and around individual and the family. So is the family unit based on money relations like Marx suggests? I was going to say, Dan, that was some beautiful writing. I must say uh, it was good listening to that stuff. <laughs> it's wholesome. Um, so to, to answer your question, uh, I mean, look, it depends on the family, right? Some families may actually want to structure their, uh, their relationships purely monetarily. Um, and you know what? It's their right to do so. How they want to do that is completely up to them. Um, now, what I can tell you in my experience, probably in your experience, in Mark's experience, and in just about everybody else that I know, uh, families seem to transcend purely commercial relationships. Um, in fact, when you mix commercial relationships into family, usually, you know, families get destroyed. I know, like me and my brother, every time we've mixed money into the relationship, um, we want to kill each other. So this idea that you know, family is purely a transactional, uh, monetary or commercial relationship, I think is mindless. Like, um, you know, most fathers, you know, will take care of their kids, you know, to, to a certain age. I mean, these days, like all the way through to like 30, 35 years old. And, you know, there's like this love element, which I guess seems to somehow, it, it's, it's strange because Marxists in one sense, they, they want to abolish uh, economic relationships because they seem to believe that, you know, love alone can bind us, um, or at least the naive ones, at least, you know, think that. Um, but simultaneously, you know, they, they make the claims that, um, you know, that the, these family relationships exist in a vacuum of love uh, and they, they only operate based on, um, based on commercial transactions and relationships amongst people. So, so it's strange. There's like contradictions uh, all over the place. And we, we make the case in there that, look, you have love and labor and you as an individual need to choose with whom you want to interact with on the basis of love and who you want to interact with on the basis of labor. And the way you interact with them on the basis of labor is uh, through an instrument called money. Like you, you don't just... I mean, some people, you know, the Mother Teresa's and the saints of the world, they might not do labor for any of it. They, they might give all of their labor up uh, as love. They might do that for everybody. And that's perfectly fine. They can choose to do that. Uh, I ain't no saint. Um, and I for damn sure ain't going around giving my love to everybody. In fact, I'm a big believer that love should be earned. Uh, respect should be earned and all that sort of stuff. So I keep a very strong wall and barrier between those things. Um, but there are those who, once they're in my inner circle, they get way more from me uh, than anyone would get if they, you know, if they didn't pay for it. So this, I mean, I think it's just a, it's, it's, it's one of those things that as Mark said at the outset, it's like when people, if they actually took the time to read the original communist manifesto, they'd be like, what is this lunatic talking about? Like what, what in the flying fuck is he saying? Um, and, how can I therefore then justify the rest of my thinking upon the doctrines of this madman? Like he just projects this babble on people that like, and, and we say it in the book, first of all, he doesn't like the bourgeoisie. Next of all, he doesn't hang around with them. He doesn't, he's not in their circles, but he goes and says that this is how their family lives function. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, what are you talking about, man? And but you know, people lap this shit up, and they listen to it, and and you wonder how, why? 
Yeah, uh, I mean, I was surprised to hear, because uh, I haven't read the Communist Manifesto, um, but I was surprised to hear that they see women as mere instruments of production. Uh, it was just very strange. It, it just sort of, uh, with where the world is going, it, it just sort of made me think of like transhumanism, and the Matrix, and like, people as batteries. It just, it really was like almost like leaps and bounds a little further than I I, I even thought it could go. Uh, but I'm, you know, moving from the family, but like the individual in the nation, I'm, I'm really curious what you guys think about, like, because uh, Alex, you brought up barriers. And so what do you guys think about boundaries? Are, you know, boundaries important, you know, and, and, and I, I'm asking that on both a local and a global sense, like, like, uh, I'm American. Does that mean something? Like, am I different than someone from France or Palestine? Or, you know, so should we have no boundaries? Mark, you want to take this one or you want me to take it? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Take that one, Alex. Okay. Um, so th this one was one that Mark and I went back and forth on. And I guess there is, like, as, you know, I'll, I'll say this much. There was kernels in truth. Th there was kernels of truth. Uh, in many of the observations that Marx made, right? Where, where I think on this one, you said this is one where we may actually agree a little bit, right? <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, we, we agree on parts of it, right? And th this is where nuance really matters, is that Marx made a lot of accurate observations, just his conclusion, the conclusions that he draws or the, or the ways to, um, to combat or do something about these uh, observations were all maniacal. So, you know, his whole thing about like uh, the nation state you know, has come to an end. I mean, he timed that wrong by about 200 years. But, um, you know, his, his position on individuals or people in general or the working man uh, transcending the state, you know, had, had some truth in it is that, you know, people don't necessarily need to be defined by their country. Um, but they certainly are defined uh, to a large degree by their values, I think people certainly can be defined by their values. And, and you know, I've got this little saying, people say, you, you know, you should uh, surround yourself by like-minded people. And I say, no, you shouldn't. You should surround yourself by like-valued people. Uh, and you should surround yourself by different-minded people because then you don't end up in a stupid echo chamber, but you end up with um, people around you with like values. And and I think if anything, uh, you know, v values are a good heuristic uh, you know, if if at all you want to kind of place yourself in uh, groups of any kind, um, but you know, remember once again we have multiple values, and you know they're always uh, sometimes uh, divergent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So so there's this complexity there too. But to, to come back to the nation state problem, it's um, you know, what Marx wanted to do was kind of equalize all workers uh, across the world, uh, destroy all boundaries and make everyone the same. So his outcome, so he had an observation, which is that there was more than just a nation state, but his solution or what he wanted to espouse off the back of that was to uh, abolish all borders and boundaries um, because in the first place, um, he didn't believe in private property rights. So communism, as he says in his book, is the abolition of private property rights. So that concept, like the nation state, for example, as, as an idea is incompatible with um, uh, the abolition of private property rights. So to, for him to stay somewhat consistent with his ideas, he has to um, abolish the nation state also, along with the family, along with everything else, right? Because there's no private property. Now, what we say is that the nation state is actually too large a territory uh, to make sense when it comes to private property rights, uh, because much of nation state boundaries are arbitrary um you know what we argue is that you know the the local communities or the city level is a good sort of uh demarcation point for um borders and boundaries and now those borders and boundaries could be physical uh, they could be cultural they could be economic that you know they could be a myriad of other things and and once again i will say that i'm not saying this is some easy solution you know like kind of trump wants to just build a fucking wall and happy days you know th there's no easy solution like that to these to these problems of borders and boundaries but borders and boundaries are fundamentally important um you know they they do help us uh create an in zone and an out zone 
And having an in zone and an out zone is very important because you know you create some sort of local homogeneity um, and you create external heterogeneity. So, so you get actual diversity um, while maintaining some level of certainty within the territory where that boundary uh, uh, presides. So, so th th these are really important things. And, and that's what, you know, for example, the globalists completely miss. The globalists want to break down all the barriers, you know, have a global government and have a McDonald's on every corner and, you know, completely destroy all the diverse cultures of the world. I mean, I always use the example of McDonald's in Bali. Like I, I went there 10 years ago, the first time, and I walk out of the airport and what's the busiest uh, cafe thing? Like fucking McDonald's. P people flew to fucking Bali mm -hmm. to go to McDonald's. I'm sitting there and thinking, what the fuck are you people doing? Like it's out of control. Like, and, and, and that's a function of this kind of distorted uh, globalism. And, you know, once again, the caveat on all of this is it's not clean. It's not easy. You know, maybe this is the process humanity just needs to sort of go through uh, in order to find our way and find sanity at the other end. I don't know. But um, anyway, I think that's what I would say about the nation state. Yeah, it is funny when you travel how, you know, you'll see Americans and Westerners all over the world going to the franchise they're familiar with. And I think there's, you know, I've never been one to do that. Uh, I think that, like you were saying, defeats a lot of things. But I think there's a notion of that. They just want a semblance of home. And it is a, uh, I don't think it's a, a positive thing for humanity, but there's a, a science to making that food taste exactly the same wherever it is in the world, which might not be a good thing for your body or, 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 or ecosystems. But yeah, it is a, a strange sight to see McDonald's being the most popular place in somewhere like Fiji or Bali. Um, uh, I'm kind of, well, I think there you, you did a good job of also dispelling the notion that we can have a common property uh, utopia. Um, so I want to read a little bit more from, from your book, which kind of goes back to what you were saying, Alex, before about love and labor. So in, in a free world, cash payment is the common language that enables the solution to the problem of inner subjective value and furthermore gives individuals the choice to accept more or less cash because they may want more of the love element than labor in their interaction. With loved ones, I may not care to measure my labor when I choose to give them something. With those I don't know, I may choose to put myself first, to love myself and to charge for my labor. This is a functional world and resembles the kind of interactions that happen in nature. This is something worth aspiring toward. Uh, I thought that was a really great way of putting it. So Mark, though, but what about like, you know, like the Scrooges of the world? Can they screw this whole thing up? Um, how do we? How does capitalism deal with them? Uh, I mean, to uh, to each their own, right? I mean, that's what Alex was making the case right there. And I think uh, to each their own. And so, some people want to be more loving, and some people want to be less loving. And I think, I think it's, I think if, I think as long as everyone understands that everything in life is a trade off. And so, for example, um, some people get. I think everyone's heard stories of uh, some of the most rich people in the world coming to their deathbeds. And not asking for their things, not asking to, can you tell me how much is in my bank account one more time or show me pictures of my yachts, right? It's always about relationships. And I think most people, unfortunately, a lot of people come to realize that later in life. Um, it's one reason why me being a father think that uh, having kids is so important for everybody because it really makes you a much less selfish person. Um, but back to the question of the Scrooges of the world, I think everything has a cost. And so if you want to be generous with your time, generous with your love, generous with your money, you're going to build good relationships. You're going to build goodwill into the world. You're going to, have, you're going to feel fulfillment there. Uh, you can be a Scrooge if you want. Nobody's going to love you. You're going to be miserable. You're going to be horrible. Uh, you're going to accumulate a lot of wealth. So what? You know, good for you. But eventually you're going to die. And all that wealth is just going to get redistributed anyway. And so, um, you know, we think in, you know, back to kind of having this um, system that is permeable where people can go up and down um, where there's consequence. Uh, that's, that's a good sign of that consequence where it's like, Hey, they can choose to be selfish. Um, it doesn't really affect me. Let them be a screwed. So what, right? Their life is going to suffer, not mine. Eventually they've suffered enough and they die. And then they're, they get redistributed back to the, you know, being permeable, allowing them to go up and down eventually gets redistributed and uh, you know, they'll find out it was the wrong way. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's another, it's another myth that's great to bust. And I want to read a little bit uh, from your work again before I ask you another question, Mark. So to liberate the world and emancipate humanity from tyranny, the individual must become the locus of civilization. 
This cannot be done by collectively organizing resources and power into the hands of yet another political group. This can only lead to more unfair expectation, exploitation across new dimensions. This emancipation can only occur when the individual is independent and responsible, when they are subject to both economic reward and economic consequence through voluntary participation or lack thereof, in a word, when the individual is sovereign. In order to claim it and return local power to the individual, the following measures may be applicable. The absolute preservation of, proper, of private property rights for everyone all the time, the abolition of all taxation and its replacement with voluntary free fee for, for service, the right and responsibility to defend oneself and the preservation of life, liberty, and private property, the abolition of any and all central banks which use fiat money and credit expansion to enrich themselves at the expense of the population who use it, a movement onto a common organic emergent monetary standard which cannot be managed, controlled, ruled, or issued by any group, organization, institution, or nation, the replacement of large-scale nation states with a patchwork of city states that are economically accountable and governed by local property owners with skin in the game. The reintroduction, assertion, and primacy of the family unit. So what this kind of brings me to, Mark, is uh, does capitalism have anything in common or is it aligned with politics? Uh, yeah, so a, a lot to unpack there. I, I guess starting with the, with the last question. Um, you know, is capitalism, is it, is it aligned with politics? And so we put a good diagram in the book that really helps to understand that uh, from a more graphical uh, perspective. Um, anybody listening to this can go get um, access to some of these charts that we're kind of referencing without getting the book. Um, I forget what the URL is, uh, Svetsky, if you know. But um, I'll share anyway, uh, yeah, it, I'll put them in the show notes. But um, anyway, to, and to answer your question, you know, we look at capitalism, and this is something that, that Alex and I uh, went back and forth with, because personally for myself, I had found myself kind of uh, abandoning the word capitalism. It's a dirty word these days, and, and the definition is uh, unclear. People think that capitalism is slavery, for example, or colonialism. So we spent a lot, we spent a whole chapter uh, breaking that apart. But to, to the point, I guess, that you're, that you're asking, you know, we said that, look, capitalism is not a system. It's not an organic system that we're that that's or I'm sorry, it's not a system that's been put together. It's not a, a political system uh, in a way to rule or something like that, but rather it's an organic thing. And so uh, we talk a lot about uh, a couple different things, uh, but I think uh, one of the examples that that we've used is that uh, Alex talks about the the time of pick some person picks up a spear or a rock and kills an animal that was capitalism because capitalism tries to do more with less, tries to be more efficient, tries to in, in you know innovate um i used to carry one one rock at a time then i made a wheelbarrow and i carry a whole bunch of rocks at one time but i think capitalism even is is more than that because capitalism is is natural organic emergent uh but it's also uh collaborative so um if alex were to have killed that animal with a rock or a spear but i had a fire going then he might come by and i say hey why don't you cook your animal on my fire and let's let's share that right and so it's free and voluntary um, and so it's an, it's just an emergent system. And we see this, it happens everywhere. Um, again, being a father of little kids, I saw it happening in, in, uh, in preschool, right? They're, they're trading, they're trading things. It's free and voluntary exchange with private property. It's stuff they have, they brought, uh, and then they do free and voluntary exchange. So we see it naturally among kids. Um, you see it in all types of nations. Um, you know, even in, uh, even in the, the most harsh, uh, regimes or even in prison, they're still trading, right? There's still capitalism that's happening, right? They're, they're trading just other things. And so it's an emergent system. It's not a political system. Um, capitalism doesn't care about your, your, uh, your views. And uh, we really want to break that apart. Now, unfortunately, today, they're trying to make freedom um, some right wing, you know, fringe thing. As a matter of fact, I just spoke at this event this last weekend, uh, Freedom Fest, and I saw Spike Cohen, who, who actually put a quote in the book for us, and he was uh, from the Libertarian Party. He put something on Twitter today where like some people were blasting him, saying that this event was for right-wing extreme, extreme white nationalists, which couldn't have been more further from the truth. I mean, there was every sex, re race, color, whatever there. I mean, it was just Freedom Fest. Um, so anyway, we, we decided to defend that and, and to the point, um, say that it's not a system. It's just natural and emergent. That's just the way the world works. Yeah, and I like how you to expand on it a bit. You kind of uh, you make a point to say, you know, it's it's not that conservatives or the right or Republicans are the representatives of capitalism, and I think that's an important distinction to make. 
So Alex, what is a, a technocracy? Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so hmm, a technocracy, this, one, this one's tricky because different people obviously define it differently. Uh, you've got the right kind of suggest it's some leftist animal and then the, the left will say it's some right, mm. uh, you know, fascist animal. Um, the, the, the way I kind of think about it is this attempt to use technology. And I guess this is what people like Jeff Booth, Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, they're kind of afraid of is that, you know, we move into a world where, mm. you know, artificial intelligence, for example, um, you know, mass digital surveillance, etc. cetera. Um, number one, you know, you've got automation sort of, you know, replaces everyone. So no one's actually got any work to do. Um, but then you kind of create these digital technocratic kind of uh, gulags, K kind of, you know, think Wally blended with Brave New World, you know, together. Um, and, you know, everyone's kind of high or uh, distracted or whatever. And, um, you know, it, it's very, very easy to make people pliable uh, and, and compliant and complacent in that sort of an environment. Um, and, you know, so, somehow the idea is that, you know, prior communism and prior attempts to centrally plan economies and governments um, and, you know, do things collectively have failed because of a lack of computational power, because of a lack of our ability to take in all the variables and make decisions because, we haven't been able to gather all the data or interpret the data or then, you know, act upon the data. Um, and a technocracy is this idea that, you know, maybe we could do that using technology. Um, and therefore, what do we need Austrian economics for? You know, what do we need uh, individual free humans for? Like what freedom is dirty. Freedom is disgusting. Like we shouldn't have freedom. What we need is compliance because the technological overlords suggest that, uh, this is how things should be done. And, you know, trust the science, uh, trust the data, uh, trust the technology, it knows best. Um, and, you know, I guess my argument is that, um, I mean, I, I guess there is genuine fears that the world does turn out like that because, I mean, you know, we've seen the, the power of, you know, the large scale companies like your Googles and like your Amazons and all that sort of stuff that they seem to, be ever pervasive. Um, but I, I don't know if that's a, you know, l l let's say a technocracy could function. I don't know if that's a world, well, I, I mean, for sure, I know it's a world that I wouldn't want to live in, but I don't know if that's a world in general where we should, you know, that, that's something we should aspire towards. I think there's a beauty in messiness. Uh, there is a beauty in, um, in uncertainty. There is a beauty in people figuring things out and making mistakes and, you know, and, you know, being human um, and not being sort of, I'll use my word, you know, sterilized automatons who you know, are obeying an algorithm um, which decides what they should or can or cannot do. Um, and I think, yeah, it's, um, I, I personally think, it's more than likely to fail because like the human spirit to me is, uh, is unbeatable and, and something will go wrong. Uh, and, and just like you sort of have in the matrix, I mean, you've got the, the stuff behind you is the matrix as the architect says in, uh, uh, in the second matrix, you know, it, it kept failing because the machines created this perfect dream world, this perfect simulation and the human mind kept rejecting it. Um, and the only way to, deal with this was for there to be an anomaly in the system. And, and the way I like to think of it, and people you know, can call this God, they can call it, you know, the randomness and the universe, the randomness of the universe, if they're more secular in nature, but basically that, that spark of life is you, you can't remove that from the equation. And, and this is something that I think will always be a thorn in the side of any form of technocracy. You know, technocracies will fail because you can't model the randomness of life or the randomness of God, whatever you want to call that. And for me, um, yeah, I think technocracy is a fool's errand. Um, I think, you know, unfortunately, 
you know, with a complacent, compliant populace, um, you know, it could succeed in some pockets and succeed to the extent that it lasts for a while. Um, and that would be very sad to see. Um, but, you know, you've got something like Bitcoin, which stands in stark contrast to that. And, you know, I have hope that at the very least, there'll be pockets of freedom and pockets of humanity uh, that that withstand that tendency to go down the technocratic path. So anyway, that's a, a lot to say there, but I hope that was helpful. Well, it's a, yeah, it's a heavy subject. I, I want to read a little bit from you guys' work. In fact, the ultimate goal of the technocrat is for some form of artificial intelligence as government and centrally issued cryptocurrency as money, combining to encapsulate and control all life under a digital panopticon. I mean, I really do see it as man versus nature, the end of free will, uh, man playing God. Um, uh, I, I do well, think they know, they know, they know that, um, they suffer from the information problem. And so like central planning always fails because it can't gather enough information that, a, that, a, that an organic market has. And so, uh, they hope that, you know, by putting something like a CBDC in place and then using some new, you know, high powered AI, uh, interface, they would have enough, um, data, they would get the data and they'd be able to sift through it and they could make better decisions than, um, the, the, the organic natural free market, which is insane to think of. Um, but I think, I think that's what they want. I think it's, it's pretty clear. I mean, in the World Economic Forum, where the own nothing and be happy came from was a paper that was written um, that started off by saying something like, um, you know, the year is 2030. Um, I have no privacy. Um, I own nothing and, and I've never been happier. So it's something like that, right? And she talks about in the paper how, um, she doesn't own anything, she doesn't have a house, whatever, but she never needs anything. Even her dreams are being read and she never needs anything. She talks about like, when I need a car, like a car just shows up, like it's just there when I need it. And so we're talking about like all of these ideas, basically going to this AI. Um, I think the, the good thing is, is in my opinion, the reality of that happening um, probably in our lifetimes is not, is not mm. realistic. Um, just from a technology standpoint, uh, and I'm not the... I'm not the technologist here, but, um, you know, I think it also fails because of the money situation, but that's what they want. And it's scary. Yeah. Um, all right. I, I want to table that a little bit of that thought for a second. I want to first ask you, Mark, like, is colonialism aligned with capitalism? Yeah. So what we did is uh, in the book, in, in the original book, um, he talked about all the different versions of uh, communism. So we did a chapter on all the versions of what people would consider capitalism. And um, we did a, we did like a, a matrix. So we kind of outlined um, all the different types of uh, colonialism or technocracies and uh, all the different types like you're, like you're referring to. And I think it's, what's important to understand is first, uh, let's, let's, let's come to the agreement and the definition of what capitalism is. And if you understand what that is, then very clearly, then you can start to see that these other things are not. So to, to the question you're asking, no, colonial, colonial, colonialism is definitely not a, not a form of capitalism. So um, I have right here, like the characteristics of capitalism would be private ownership, uh, private control of production, private property rights, um, capital accumulation, you know, market pricing, voluntary exchange, voluntary participation. So uh, I didn't read them all, but think about that in terms of colonialism, right? Do they have private ownership? No, right? They were taken over. Um, do they have private control of production? No, right? Whoever uh, put the colonialism in has, has, has control of that. Private property rights? Of course not, right? Are, are the markets free? No, of course not, right? And so I think if you start with the definition, a, a correct definition. And so a lot of people just say, well, capitalism just means that uh, you have a bunch of money and you can just do whatever you want with it. Well, uh, that's why they draw that colonialism would be the nat one of the natural paths that, that, that capitalism would take or, or slavery or cronialism. If you have enough money and, you, and you're just trying to make as much capital as you can, but it's like, no, that's not the definition. And so I think if we, if we say what the definition is, you clearly see none of those are forms of capitalism. Right. And, um, uh, you know, just in these, these times we live in, Alex, I'm, I'm wondering, why is Marxism so appealing? I'm glad you sent this one to me. This is one of my favorite thought experiments. And this is, I, I guess, Mark and I asked ourselves this question. We went back and forth and, you know, talked about it. And the, the answer we came up with was this, 
you know, it's, it's easier to destroy than it is to build. Um, it's easier to bring someone down than it is to raise them up. Uh, you know, it's easier to have a nice flat lawn by mowing it. You know, you're not going to get it by the grass growing naturally. So, you know, I mean, it's easier to sit on your ass and watch Netflix um, than it is to go to the gym, right? It's easier to sit around and do nothing than it is to go build a business and work and, you know, you know, create value or be productive. And basically Marxism is an entire doctrine built around justifying laziness, entitlement, and, you know, progressive rights for people who don't want to actually go out there and create or build something, but want to be handed it by defining themselves as part of the group that was oppressed. Simple as that. Like Marx's doctrine that, you know, all of history apparently can be condensed down to the struggle between the oppressors and the oppressed. So Marxist acolytes position themselves as the oppressed so that they can get handouts and so that they can basically get shit for free from someone else um, and sit around and fucking do nothing but complain. Um, and that is a much easier lifestyle. So, so what, what we kind of boiled it down to was that Marxism is effectively a, an academic uh, intellectual justification for laziness and entitlement. That's really all it is. And you've got this idiot who wrote a bunch of words, contradicted himself a hundred times, um, said a bunch of shit basically. Um, and then all the lazy lemmings of the world um, picked it up and said, fuck, I can just label myself as oppressed and get free shit. Fuck it, I'm going to do it. Um, and, you know, like that's the subconscious thing that they're telling themselves, you know, consciously they're telling themselves, oh, poor me, woe is me, you know, the I've been mansplained or, you know, mm -hmm. this guy on the train, you know, opened his legs and now I'm traumatized and I therefore need uh, another handout or something like that. Um, so, you know, they, they, you know, a lot of these people genuinely believe they're victims of some sort. Um, and yeah, communism kind of gives them a political ideology to take hold of and, um, and validate their meaningless existence with, um, you know, I'm not going to pull any punches for these people. You know, I, I have no remorse for these, for this sludge. Um, but you know, that's kind of what Marxism did and it's, um, it's disgusting. Uh, I want to expand on that with your own words. Uh, says sloth. So, so some people merely want to justify their sloth, their envy and their malice. You quote, they direct their attacks not against the bourgeoisie conditions of production, but against the instruments of production themselves. They destroy imported wares that compete with their labor, they. Translated into simple English, he says, if you cannot outcompete them, burn it all down. Are these not the words of a mindless animal? This quote sums up the morality of Marx and the basis upon which all collectivist ideologies stand. Quote, if you can't make something better, burn it all down, quote or more succinctly and unfortunately historically accurate, quote, if you can't beat them, kill them, quote. So, you know, we, we've talked a little bit about lemmings here, Alex. We've, we've talked about dumb people in the past, um, but mm -hmm. what is a Luddite? A Luddite. Okay, so this is, this was, this was funny. While we were writing, Mark was like, hey, you know, maybe we're being a little bit too mean. And I was like, no, 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 the Luddites did exist. <laughs> they are real. So the Luddites were this, uh, this group of people who followed the, the preaching of this guy called, I think it was Ned Ludd was his name. Um, and he was one of, you know, these kind of very similar to the Al Gores and the, um, and the Greta Thunbergs of the world today, right? Uh, he ran around saying that the windmills and the automation is going to put us all out of work and we're all going to die. Automation is going to kill us all. Um, back in the 1700s, right? So they went around and they destroyed, you know, the factories, the windmills and everything like that so that they could uh, keep jobs for the workers to do shit manually. And it's just like, 
the Marxists and the Luddites, you know, share a common ideology. It's like that they actually have so little faith in human ingenuity that they think that if we were somehow to automate shit jobs, that we would be unable to find something better to do with our lives. So we should destroy all of these processes and relegate workers to be, you know, workers working 40 hours a week for the rest of their lives. Fucking amazing. What a genius. Like, this is how dumb these people are. And I mean, the, the Luddites were a whole crew. And, you know, you've got the neo Luddites who have been banging on all, you know, for the last 100 years, for the last 50 years, for the last 20 years, that automation is going to destroy everything, yada, yada, yada. Um, and here we are going strong because what human beings do naturally is we create new abstractions. And as we sort of discussed earlier with the whole innovation thing, is we find new angles. We, we mix and match things again and again and again. And there's no end to the amount of abstraction uh, that we can create. And it's a good thing that somebody doesn't have to work the shit ugly fucking job anymore. If we can automate that away, then that person has an opportunity to do something else. It's a fantastic thing. Now, Luddites aren't as much of a problem now. And it, what's, what's funny is the Marxists that's kind of like flipped their script now and now they're pro uh, automation, and they're you know they're they're pro all this sort of stuff, um, and you know they they want to kind of move everyone into the educational realm so that everyone can become uh, you know trans fucking you know academics of some sort so that they can philosophize about nothing and uh, find new ways to extract wealth from the productive people. So. I don't know. It's it's super weird, man. But um, yeah, I I don't know what the original question was, but anyway. No, I think you did a great job covering it. Um, I, you guys quoted Anne Rand in your book: "A free market is a corollary of a free mind." And I I do want to emphasize this whole free mind of private property and um, human action. So. And what I also appreciated uh, very early on, I think it was the second page of the book uh, behind the, the cover, is uh, you guys clearly say no copyright here. Ideas are not IP. So share this far and wide, pirate it, get it into as many hands as possible. If you found value in it, feel free to buy some copies and support us. I, I loved the book. Um, I have a couple more questions for you guys. Um, Mark, I'm wondering, you know, building a little bit on our private conversation about cycles and revolutions. Uh, I'm curious what you think about how technology in terms of the exponential technology, like the internet and around this sort of digital panopticon and, you know, maybe ultimately, you know, those sort of state efforts and centralized planning fail, but it, it seems like it could be a very painful experiment. How does sort of the internet maybe, um, alter this cycle from the state's uh, vantage point? Does it give them maybe in a, a tool that they, they didn't have before? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, tools are, are just that, right? They're tools. So um, a screwdriver could help you fix a car or build something constructive, or you could kill somebody with a screwdriver, mm -hmm. right? It, uh, a tool in the hand of a skilled person is very helpful. A tool in the hand of someone who doesn't know what to do with it is, is not helpful. So tools are just tools. And so the internet is definitely a tool um, and it can be used uh, for good and for bad. Um, I think, you know, the internet, I think, has done more to destabilize the centralization of the government. And so, you know, I talk about this 250 year pendulum that swings back and forth. And we've been on this trend towards centralization. Um, and a lot of that has been driven by technology. So if you look back through all of history, it's always technology that shifts the balance of power and really changes history. And so um, the Industrial Revolution led us towards the centralization. So everybody wanted to move um, to the cities, um, not just any city, but the big cities, you know, Chicago, New York, et cetera. Um, the nations were able to extract wealth from those because it was so easy there within their borders. But the internet now has... Um, started decentralizing. So now we have all these small businesses instead of these giant businesses. And these small businesses can be run from anywhere in the world. Uh, but more importantly, it's allowed us to share information much faster and it's, a, it's a, made it impossible for them to keep and control narratives, 
which I think is what's really happened over the last uh, maybe decade um, that really has accelerated where we're headed right now, which is that they've been trying to manage a narrative uh, forever um, and they've just completely lost it because of the internet. So on one hand, it's, it's decentralized us. It's made us smaller uh, as the book Sovereign Individual talks about, it's lowered their return on violence. So it makes it harder for them to extract wealth out of us through violence. Um, and it's, it's a cause where they've lost the narrative. Now we can share information much faster. We can see the light, et cetera. Um, however, they can also use it to put us into a social credit score system. Um, a good example, I mean, we have plenty of examples because they've been doing it in China for a long time. In 2018, I think it was... Uh, 60 million people were denied buying bus tickets because their social credit score system was too low. Uh, but we saw just recently, you know, uh, you think the debt problem is bad in the United States. We're at about 125% debt to GDP and in China, they're at 350%. They got a serious debt problem and now the banks are running out of money. And so right now today they have a massive protest going on at the banks because the people are mad. They want to get their money, but they were trying to protest the banks weeks ago. And then when everybody was going to, to go protest the banks, all their, uh, phones, all their health passports turned red with COVID and they weren't able to get money. They weren't able to buy bus tickets. They weren't able to go and protest. They just, oh, I, oh, I didn't know. I guess I got COVID now. Um, and they were able to squ squash the protests. And so, but, but now it's just too late, right? That the people are mad they're protesting, but to the point um, they've used the internet to build this prison, use these, you know, health passports and so, and so forth. However, at the same time, it's a tool for us to, to break out from them. So it's always going to be that, that struggle. Uh, but I think the internet is the tool that we need to get free from it. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think the internet and, and Bitcoin, and it was very interesting. I want to read two pieces from the book and ask my final question. So democracy is the most dangerous when combined with any version of cronyism as the unproductive majority will always wish to vote themselves more benefits paid for by the more productive minority, hence modernity. A couple pages later, you guys go on to say, like their Luddite predecessors, Marx and his ilk had such little faith in human ingenuity and a low opinion of the capacity for individual improvement that instead of encouraging the proletariat to rise up to a new standard, they should bring everything down to theirs. As I said earlier, it's easy, easier to destroy than it is to create. It's easier to kill than it is to give life. It's easier to bring another down than it is to raise them up. The siren call of entropy is strong. This ideology is unfortunately the product of a person who succumbed to their own inadequacies, projected it on others and in a fearful rage demanded that others remain in the dungeon of nihilism with him because he feared to be left alone. He feared to stand up, so he wanted to cut everyone else down. A better future. This is why you, dear reader, must now stand up. Again, this is a call to arms. I know that you guys, you know, based it and riffed off of the Communist Manifesto, but did you guys ever think about calling the book the Bitcoin Manifesto? Yeah, I mean... We, we played around with the name quite a bit. We were thinking of the Capitalist Manifesto, but apparently Kiyosaki mm. was doing that. We thought Naturalist, Individualist Manifesto, like all these different names. I think Bitcoin Manifesto, we're going to save for a future book. You know, I think Mark and I might write a whole series of these little manifesto books and maybe do a short book specifically more about Bitcoin. So I think this one was much needed because th there's, there's a whole lot of Bitcoin books out there already and some quite right. good ones, both short and long. And what, what our sort of strategy was with this was to do a much broader topic um, that is the zeitgeist of the time at the moment. And it, it is that there's a whole movement towards communism and there's a whole counter movement against it. And the, what you'll notice in the book, and I mean, you, you, you'll have read between the lines, you know, being a Bitcoiner, understanding this, is that we only have a short piece explicitly dedicated to Bitcoin. But the entire premise of the Bitcoin, uh, sorry, of the book is predicated on the existence of something like Bitcoin. So when we talk about dynamic inequality and these kind of uh, permeable, permeable classes and all this sort of stuff, none of that can really exist unless you fix the money first. Um, you know, they're all fantasies. They're all theoretical in nature. Like, but if you fix the money, you, you have an opportunity to make that right. stuff um, real. So, so it is a Bitcoin book without a Bitcoin name. Um, and we hope I love that we Bitcoin can... books that don't bring up Bitcoin. 
I'm mean, yeah. the price of tomorrow. It doesn't come up to maybe the second to last page. Even the Bitcoin standard, it really doesn't come up at the beginning. And, and, and I think it's important to make the case for Bitcoin without even dealing with Bitcoin. Totally. And, and, and it's just sort of um, to what you're saying, there's a lot of books around uh, what is Bitcoin, uh, but there's not a lot of arguments or books around like why you need Bitcoin without mentioning what Bitcoin is, what, what the problem is. And I think it is very, uh, I didn't think of it, but it's very zeitgeisty uh, with, with the amount of Marxism in the world and, and, and communism. And, you know, to your earlier point, I mean, I, I know what these things are, but like I never really did my research on them. I, I kind of yeah. got that they're not that very good and I didn't need to do the research, I just felt. But I'm not well versed in them. And I think that this book was uh, really fantastic in that way to kind of just shed a lot of light. And so I really appreciate it. I do think it's a call to arms and, and sort of a different one, which is very important. It's called to uh, individuality and responsibility and accountability and ingenuity and innovation. And it dispels a lot of misnomers about capitalism, which I think is very important in this moment, because I think there's a tremendous movement towards communism and I don't see anyone supporting capitalism. And, and, and I think most people misunderstand it in a lot of the ways that we covered tonight. So I, I appreciate the, the, the work you guys put into the book. Uh, I, I think it's awesome. I'll leave it to you guys for any parting words and to let people know where you can each uh, find you each individually and your work individually and your work together. So uh, maybe Alex, you can go first. Sure. So thank you, Cedric. I appreciate you having us on. And I think I do hope that people will find a lot of value in the book. Um, I will say the way to support us. Uh, I mean, we, like I said, we don't, oh, as you sort of mentioned, we don't have a copyright on the book so people can, you know, share it around and all that sort of stuff. Um, but what we do ask is that in the first 36 hours of launching, we're going to knock the Kindle down to 99 cents. So what we do ask is that people buy it um, and leave a verified review. The more verified reviews we get in the first week, the better chance we have of landing on the bestseller list. And if we land on the bestseller list, then there's a high possibility that this book will get in front of a whole lot of people. And, and that's really what we want to do with this thing is we want the message to go spread far and wide. Like the book's not going to be expensive. It'll be something like 12 bucks or 13 bucks or whatever it is. And it'll be just one of those things that gets out there. And, and, and that's the real MO for us here is that um, we, we want that to occur. So first of August, it goes out, keep an eye out, go to uncommunist.com, pop mm. your email in there and you'll be notified as soon as it does go live on Amazon so that you can pick up the cheap copy. I mean, if you want to support us, by all means, go get the soft cover or the hard cover. You know, it'll be 13 bucks. And I think the hard cover, we're going to price at $21 and 21 cents. Another little meme in there. Um, and yeah, I, I just want people to read this, you know, get, get a couple copies, hand it out, drop it off at your local library, you know, give it to your friends, your family, people you care about, um, pass it around at school. Like that's, that that's how this information will spread and you know that that's kind of how the communist manifested to a large degree spread um at a time when that was the zeitgeist right and now i think there's there's a there's a reversal of that and i hope that our book can help um help with this next chapter in human history yeah i think it's really interesting um angle and zeitgeist theme uh, topic mark uh, yeah, I would uh, I would say the same thing. Another thing I'd bring up, though, is that um, we have a bunch of extras. So we built out like a members area. We have a bunch of extras. So we have uh, uh, Alex and I have done a bunch of video discussion about this uh, behind the scenes stuff. Uh, we've done videos for each chapter. We have um, we have like all the images and graphics that are from the book, uh, digital copies, audio copies, a bunch of extras. Um, and so if you go and sign up on uncommunist.com, you can go buy on Amazon, but on, on if you come to our website, we'll give you all those extras as well. So um, we're just trying to do as much as we can to kind of help shift the direction the world is going into with this uh, Marxism and every new flavor of neo-Marxism and cultural Marxism, et cetera. It's, uh, like Alex said, it's the, it's the time and place for it. Um, so anyway, check that out on communist.com. Um, get ready to go buy that book on uh, August 1st and on Amazon. If you can time it just right, you can get that special deal. And um, we're just asking for a review and exchange hopefully we get that um and then then i would just finally just say as a as a challenge and, and that's that um you know i believe that good ideas win because they're good i believe or better i should say i believe uh they should i believe they can be uh they can good ideas can win because they're better but also when they're conveyed intelligently and so we hope this book can give you that um 
ammo that you need to kind of understand both both sides of the argument, um, give you the better ideas. And then we just hope that you just learn it, but share it, right? Discuss it, share it, buy a couple copies, hand them out to your friends, or just share the ideas that you've learned. And uh, hopefully, um, hopefully we can turn the tide that the world's going into. Yeah, well, I love the book. Uh, I can't wait to see you guys at uh, Big Bok Boom and uh, see you at the book signing. Uh, I think it is an important book and I do encourage people to share it with their family and friends and read it for themselves first. Uh, thank you so much, fellas. This has been incredible. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Cedric.